Um, this concept here, when we talk about oxygen debt, again, some of the this, this some, some of this material is more ap applicable if we were to be taking a, an exercise physiology course. But um, the book does mention this, and so I like to talk about oxygen debt because basically, when you're done doing whatever type of activity, it doesn't actually have to be uh, 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 exercise. It could be something in which maybe you're doing yard work or whatever, chopping a tree down, chopping up wood, doesn't matter. All right? You're going to be utilizing the, the, the oxygen all right, that has been uh, provided for the cellular respiration. And what we need to do is we need to take in an additional amount to restore your body to the way it was prior to engaging in whatever type of activity it was. We call pre-exercise uh, conditions, pre-working conditions, whatever. Okay, but what, what we need to do is we need to take a certain amount of oxygen in, all right, in order to replenish all that ATP that you used up. Okay, so in order to understand that, uh, keep in mind, all right, we have two molecules that play a role when we're dealing with oxygen. Okay, two protein molecules. One's in your blood, and we're all familiar with that, the hemoglobin. Okay, that's what um, is going to deliver oxygen to your cells. Well, in the muscle, we have myoglobin. Okay, the hemoglobin helps to give that red tint to your blood. Okay, whereas myoglobin helps to give that red tint to your muscles. All right, so we're going to stick oxygen onto both of those molecules. Because most likely we took the oxygen that was on those molecules during our workout. So we want to put it back on there. So we want to fill those all back up. All right? We want to restore the glycogen that was in our muscles and our liver. Okay? So obviously we're going to get that from glucose. So if uh, our blood sugar levels are adequate, then we're going to start taking some of that uh, glucose out of our blood and storing it in the liver and the skeletal muscle. Okay? ATP. We need to restore the ATP levels, all right, for that on-hand uh, uh, energy exposure, okay, that we saw in the phosphate transfer system. And speaking of phosphate transfer system, we need to put phosphate back onto creatine. Now, where do we keep phosphate? Does anyone remember where phosphate is? Store it in our bones, okay? So the hydroxyapatite. So we can release some of that phosphate from our bones if there isn't enough lying around in the cells to restore, okay? And then we talked about that lactic acid there, okay? If we didn't have enough of uh, oxygen to convert pyruvate, all right, uh, and get it into the uh, mitochondria, all right, well, the body will then convert it into lactic acid. Well, in this case, now we're gonna take that lactic acid and we're gonna ship it off to the liver and then the liver will undergo gluconeogenesis and convert that lactic acid into glucose. And then we can store that glucose if we need to as glycogen. Okay? So the body's really good at going through a lot of these processes and really determining um, how it wants to kind of prepare itself for a rainy day, for the next workout, for the next exercise, for the next activity. All right, so it has all these mechanisms. And there's a couple others that we haven't talked about, but um, we shouldn't concern ourselves with that. Okay, so I want to talk to you folks now about muscle fibers. And you may have heard of the different types of muscle fibers, slow twitch versus fast twitch. All right, we're going to get a little bit more detail about that. Okay, so when we talk about our muscle fibers, our cells there, okay, we break it down into two classifications. All right, the first is what type of contraction are we going to make? All right when this muscle contracts. Is it going to be a fast contraction? Bang. Or is it going to be nice and slow? Like what your back is doing right now. Your postural muscles, that's a slow contraction, keeping you upright. Okay? And then, how do we supply ATP, okay, to, all right, the muscles? Okay? How do we supply ATP to the muscles? So let's first start about, talk about the type of contraction. You can see that there's three important, all right, uh, uh, um, characteristics: power, how forcible that contraction is, how quick that contraction is, and how long we can contract it for. Okay. 
So when we talk about power, all right, we're going to talk about the diameter of the muscle fiber. Obviously, more is better. So the larger the muscle fiber, the more powerful the contraction. Okay, more muscle involved, more fibers, more power generated. Okay. Now the speed and duration is based on, oh, there it is. I told you we were going to see all right, ATPase again, that enzyme. Okay. So in this scenario, with speed and duration, we're going to, it, it all involves that ATPase enzyme, the myosin ATPase. Okay. And some of the characteristics are going to be how quickly it can generate and manage that, <clears throat> excuse me, that action potential propagation, all right? Is it send it on down the axon uh, fast or really fast, okay? And also how quickly we can release calcium, all right, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then how fast we can collect that calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, from the sarcoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so that all plays a role for speed and duration, right? And that enzyme is going to play a role with that, that myosin ATPase. Okay. All right. So how do we supply the other characteristic? Or yeah, a characteristic is going to be. All right. Did I skip one? No, I did. Okay. So let me, let me quickly just talk about uh, the, the fiber types here, fast versus the slow, okay? So you heard me talk about the fast variant versus the slow variant. Let's go to slow because, look, there's hardly anything written under there, <laughs> all right? So slow twitch muscle fibers have the slow variant version of that myosin ATPase, okay? And fast twitch have everything else. So what does that mean? Well, look, fast helps to determine what we're talking about, okay? We can initiate a contraction much quicker, all right, after it's stimulated, all right, that means that that propagation of that action potential along the sarcolemma, sarcolemma is lightning fast, bam, all right. Unfortunately, it will be, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, all right, that's to make it sound like it's a bad thing, okay, but this type of contraction will not last as long, okay, which is pretty good for forcible powerful contractions. So we're going to get a nice strong contraction. So the, these type of muscle fibers are going to produce more power all right, and speed than the slow twitch. Well, that makes sense. I mean, it'd be kind of goofy to, to think that the slow twitch is going, to is going to be faster than the fast twitch when it produces a contraction. Okay. But keep in mind, part of that is because of how quickly we can move that action potential or how quickly we can propagate that action potential along the circle level, all right? And then how quickly we can release calcium and then once it's released, how we can pick it back up from the sarcoplasm and bring it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So fast twitch have a lot going on. Okay, so I want to talk about the other characteristic and that's going to be the type are the, the, the means of supplying our energy, our ATP, okay? So the two types that we do that, uh, the, how we do this is through oxidative versus glycolytic. If you look at the words, all right, oxidative, all right, you want to be thinking oxygen. And what does that mean? Aerobic cellular respiration, all right? So we also call, I uh, can't talk tonight. We also call this type okay, of muscle fiber fatigue resistant, all right? So if it's aerobic cellular respiration is going to be its primary method of supplying ATP, that means we're going to have lots of mitochondria. Only makes sense. Well, if we're going to have lots of mitochondria because mitochondria need oxygen, well, how do we get oxygen to the mitochondria? We're going to have an extensive vascular supply. So we're going to have lots of capillaries. And not only that, in these muscle fibers, all right, we're going to have tons of myoglobin. All right, that's that oxygen-carrying molecule inside the muscle fibers. And like I said before, that myoglobin gives the muscle tissue its red appearance. Okay? So since these are fatigue-resistant, they can contract for a long period of time because they got lots of ATP. 
Lots and lots and lots. Okay. Now, the other type of fiber is the glycolytic. And if you look at the name, glycolytic, okay, think of glycolysis. Glycolysis is an anaerobic type of respiration. So these will be the type that can fatigue. They can get tired. And think of it because they're just going to run out of energy faster. All right? So they're going to have less vascular supply, okay? Therefore, less mitochondria, fewer myoglobin molecules, all right? Now, granted, they're going to have a large glycogen reserve there, all right, because they're going to undergo anaerobic respiration, but eventually they're going to run out, all right? So these are going to have an appearance of white because of that um, uh, decreased amount of myoglobin, and in some fibers, we won't have any myoglobin, okay? So they are fatigable. They won't last very long, all right? So they're not going to be able to undergo a long period of time for sustained activity. thought you got locked out again. I did. Oh. You had a from you didn't, you didn't message me. Well, she was trying to get in. Her face won't look in the face. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, for shame. All right, I was worried. I was like, all right, let's see what happened to Robert. See if he's out there. <clears throat> I was gonna, I was gonna send out a search party for you. I really was. I promise you. Okay. So that's oxidative versus glycolytic. Now we're gonna start to break down. All right. In a moment some of the different types of muscle fibers. We get specific, there's three, because for a long time we just said fast twitch versus slow twitch, or red muscle fibers versus white muscle fibers. Now we're a little bit more specific. We have three different types that we're gonna talk about. But first, how about a question? How does a fast twitch fiber differ from a slow twitch fiber? Okay, think faster, stronger, bigger. So we're gonna have stronger contractions. We can initiate our contractions quicker, all right? And but unfortunately, the fast or twitch are going to have shorter duration, all right? But they'll be quick, all right? And then, how does an oxidative fiber differ from a glycolytic fiber, okay? Oxidative fibers have all the stuff in it, mitochondria, lots of capillaries, lots of myoglobin, all right? They're going to appear red, all right? And since they have all this energy uh, uh, supply and the means to make it, they are going to be harder to fatigue, all right? Glycolytic is going to undergo anaerobic cellular respiration. Yes, they're going to have lots of glycogen there, all right, but it's going to burn through those stores, all right? Eventually, they're not going to be able to sustain their contractions, so they will tire easily when we're trying to do sustained contraction. They'll have fewer myoglobin, if any at all, all right? Fewer mitochondria and less of, of a vascular network of capillaries, okay? All right, so there's three types. Okay, the first type, which is type one, okay, those are the slow, now look at the terms, slow oxidative. Okay, so we know, all right, there's slow twitch muscle fibers mixed with oxidative fibers, which are going to then allow them, all right, that's your means of making the ATPAs. So the slow have to do with the slow variant of our ATPAs. Okay, so slow, their contractions, all right, obviously are not going to be of the fast twitch nature. They're going to be slower, and they're going to be less powerful, okay? But the nice thing about this, since they're oxidative, they'll be high endurance because their ATP supply is aerobic, all right? So these fibers will have a nice red hue to them because of the myoglobin there, all right? And they'll have their nice supply of capillaries, mitochondria there, okay? So they can sustain their contraction for a long period of time. These muscles are wonderful for postural muscles. Okay, the next type are the fast oxidative fibers, okay, or the type 2A. They have the fast variant ATPAs, okay, so therefore those contractions are going to be quick, all right, and powerful, all right. They're awesome because they also have aerobic respiration, 
All right. So they'll still have a nice red hue to them because of that myoglobin. Okay. Problem is, we just don't have a lot of these. And finally, the third type is the fast glycolytic. These are the type 2B. Okay. They have the fast variant. Okay. Fast and powerful. Okay, these are the ones that you're going to find the most throughout the body. Okay, problem is fast, so the contractions are quick and short. All right, and unfortunately, their ATP production is primarily anaerobic. Okay, so these guys, since they're glycolytic, they will not have a high supply or of any of myoglobin. All right, virtually no uh, mitochondria. So they're going to have that white appearance. <clears throat> okay, so these are the three muscle types. Now you have to understand a muscle can have all three muscle types in it. Okay, so we're going to see, and I'll, actually I'll show you this quick picture here of this muscle. Here you go. Here's a perfect example. Here's a muscle fascicle. All right, we just yanked it out, and then we took an electron microscope, and here you can see all the different types of muscle fibers. You get the fast glycolytic, the slow oxidative, all right? You've got uh, the fast oxidative, they're just varying in numbers, okay? Slow oxidative, nice and red, okay? Fast glycolytic are virtually white. The fast oxidative, a little bit uh, uh, darker than white, okay? But you can see, all right, muscles will have all three variants there, all right? And it just varies depending on the proportions of those uh, fiber types depend, uh, varies depending on what type of muscle we're talking about. If we're in the hand, for example, okay, we're going to have a lot of the fast glycolytic fibers. Think about how quick some of the, the contractions that you're going to have in your hand that will occur. All right? But like I was saying before, your postural muscles, all right, those are going to be the slow oxidative because, one, all right, that's going to be a larger muscle group but they're going to have to sustain those contractions for long periods of time. All right, think about how long. I mean, I've been sitting here in this position, I don't know, for the past 15 minutes. All right, I've been engaging my back uh, postural muscles that whole time, the erector spinae muscle. They have to keep me upright. All right, quadratus lumborum, same thing. All right, all of those muscles are engaging. So I'm primarily using those slow oxidative fibers there. Okay, long distance runners will have a ton of slow oxidative fibers in the legs, okay? And then sprinters, all right, they need that quick explosive power, all right? Football players, running backs especially, they'll have those fast glycolytic fibers because they need that explosive quick amount of energy, all right, to move fast over short periods or short um, uh, distances. Now, this is an important, I don't know why I put it at the bottom, but this is an important, important concept here. All right, the distribution of the muscle types, you're born with what you have. Okay, so the genes make up a majority of your makeup of what type of muscle fibers. Okay, I'm going to have different proportions of slow oxidative and fast oxidative um, compared to you guys. And we're all going to be varying depending on what we do. Now, training, all right, well, will, will uh, help with the development of some of those types, but it's primarily what, with what you're born with, your genetic makeup. All right, you can look at some people and be like, man, that person, you ever seen, I've never seen um, speed skaters. You ever seen speed skaters, the thighs on them in the Olympics? They're huge. They're gigantic. Running backs? I've never seen a six foot seven running back whose thighs are uh, about as, this big. You know, they're going to have huge thighs. They're going to have explosive power, okay? All right. So which muscle fiber type primarily composes muscles that maintain posture? The slow oxidative, okay? It takes a while to fatigue them. Okay, so talking about contractions and whatnot and different types of contractions, explosions, uh, explosive contractions versus slow contractions, all right? I want to talk to you about this concept called muscle tension, okay? It's really important that you understand when we talk about muscle tension, we are talking about the amount of force that a muscle generates 
when it's undergoing contraction. So we've actually created an experiment to measure this. When I was in college, we did this same experiment. We took a frog, cut its brain out. All right, I hated doing that, but we did it. And then we hooked up its leg onto a contraption very similar to what you're seeing here. All right, we had a weight on one end of it. All right, and then we hooked up all right, a, a cord to it to stimulate our neurological innervation of it. Okay, and then we were able to monitor what was going on. So that's what we're going to do here. And we're going to talk about this phenomenon called a muscle twitch. Okay, and a twitch is basically an actual single contraction that follows a neurological stimulation. Okay, and that's what we're seeing here. Here's our stimulus, we zap it with a little bit of electricity, okay, then it contracts, then it relaxes. That's it, okay? One zap, one contraction, followed by relaxation. Always remember, all right, what follows depolarization? Two things can follow depolarization, well, two things will follow depolarization. Repolarization and contraction, okay? Well, relaxation always follows contraction. Keep in mind, keep that in mind, because you're going to have to remember those concepts very soon in 2.11. Okay, so a muscle twitch. So like I said, we zap it once, okay, and we get a quick contraction followed by relaxation. All right, so obviously, if we've generated enough voltage to stimulate a contraction, we have triggered the threshold, right? If it's a human muscle, it's negative 65 millivolts is the threshold value, okay? So once we stimulate the muscle, okay, we have that brief period there. We call that the delay, all right, where nothing happens, okay? The muscle hasn't done anything yet, but we zapped it, okay? Then the muscle contracts, okay? So we're going to talk about what occurs during that latent period. Well, think of everything that happens. All right, we have to generate an EPP, and then that EPP has to generate a muscle action potential that has to travel down the sarcolemma, then it goes to a T-tubule, then it has to release calcium, all right, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum terminal cisternae, and then all that calcium has to diffuse into the sarcoplasm, and then it has to move the troponin tropomyosin complex. So all that has to happen before we get our contraction. So all of that happens during the latent period during the delay, okay? Now, what we know that happens during the contraction period is power strokes, okay? We see the cross bridging occurring, and we're seeing the muscle contract and movement occurring, so we know power strokes are happening, thin filaments are being pulled by the thick filaments, okay? Then, when we stop the contraction, all right, we know what happens during the re relaxation period. If you're not sure what happens during the relaxation period, I strongly urge you to go back and look at this slide here. That's what happens during the relaxation period. All of that, which I don't want to talk about again. All right? I mean, I would, but time is of the essence. Okay? So all of that happens. Okay? Starting with the releasing of the cross bridges, and then all that calcium has to go back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, yada, yada, yada. Okay? But what we do know is that relaxation takes a little bit longer than contraction. Okay? I'll give you a second to write that down. All right, so that's one. Keep in mind, you need to understand or know what a muscle twitch is. Okay? It's a brief contraction followed by relaxation after being stimulated, all right? So one single contraction followed by relaxation. Cool? Okay. So what events are occurring in a muscle that produce the different components of a muscle twitch? All right, here are the three events, the latent period, the contraction period, and the relaxation period. All right, so everything that leads up to that generation of tension, okay, like I said, all right, everything that happens at the neuromuscular junction, the release of acetylcholine, all right, 
the propagation of the action potential down the sarcolemma. All that is occurring during the latent period. Okay. Think of the contraction period, power strokes. All right. Relaxation, we are no longer having cross bridge formation going on. Okay. And calcium is being put back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right. So now we're going to talk about a very important concept called motor unit recruitment. Now, before we go into there, let me just define what a motor unit is for you. Okay. A motor unit. And I'll go back to that slide in a second. A motor unit includes, all right, one single motor neuron and all of the fibers that it controls. Okay. One single motor neuron and all the fibers that it controls. Okay. So motor neuron cells are going to be that, that, that neuron cell, all right, that is going to receive information from the central nervous system. Well, what's that? Brain or spinal cord. Okay. And then it's going to transmit that information down an axon. Now, remember, we talked about the multipolar axon or, or, or neuron. And it's a cell that's got, you know, single cell body, right, an axon. And at the end, it's got all these telodendra here with the synaptic knobs. But do not forget, all right, some of these cells can have collaterals. So we can have an axon coming off the main axon. And then they can have their own little bit of synaptic knobs, okay? So keep that in mind. They can branch. So this allows them to one single motor, this is one single motor neuron, it can innervate several skeletal muscle fibers. Lots, okay? Don't forget about these collaterals that come off. So they can innervate their muscle fibers. Here's a muscle fiber. Here's another muscle fiber. Here's another muscle fiber. All right. And it's only one cell, one motor neuron that does all that. Okay. So that's why you need to know this definition. Okay. All right. Um, we'll come back to that one. All right. So let's go back to this concept here. Okay. So now what we're going to talk about when we talk about recruitment. Okay, this is when we're going to see a muscle that gets repeatedly stimulated. Okay, and as we repeatedly stimulate it, we're going to up the voltage. And as we do that, okay, we're going to see how we can recruit more motor units. So, an increase in voltage. We're going to start recruiting more motor units, all right? So we call this recruitment multiple motor unit. What is this word? Summation, adding up, okay? So this is basically, and I did this the other day, and I thought about this concept because I'm a weirdo. I went to pick up a bottle. and uh, uh, Actually, it was a, a, my coffee cup, okay, or a thermos or whatever you call it. And... Um, I thought it was full. It was empty. So I just quick, quickly picked it up and I almost hit myself in the head with it because in my head, I thought it was full, right? that it was going to be heavier. So my arm recruited way more motor units than it needed to. The more motor units that you recruit, the more muscle tension, the more force you can generate. I uh, generated too much. And if you think about it, like the example here, it says to lift a pencil versus lifting a heavy suitcase you're going to recruit far fewer motor units to lift that pencil up. Smaller, it's lighter. When I go to lift up that suitcase, I'm going to recruit more motor units, all right? More muscle fibers, okay? Because it's heavier, so I need to generate more, okay? So with this concept here, we're going to find out that at a certain voltage, all right, we will have recruited all the motor units, and we can't recruit anymore. Right? And I can keep turning that voltage up and keep turning it up and up and up past that point, and you're going to get the same result. You will eventually stimulate it every single motor unit, and you can't do it anymore past a certain voltage. So there is a, a plateau. Okay. So when we start to recruit motor units, we're always going to do the smallest ones first. All right. 
and then go to the medium and then eventually to the largest ones. So smallest first, largest last. Okay? Which makes sense. Smaller motor units will generate less tension, less force. Larger motor units are going to generate more force, more tension. Okay? So that's what we're going to do here. So that leads me to, i got to move these slides. They're kind of out of order. Sorry, I caught it. Okay. So when we talk about the motor units, all right, the very number of fibers a neuron innervates here, all right, that's going to be the size of our motor unit. So smaller motor units, less force. Larger motor units, and you can see a small motor unit can have up to five muscle fibers. Okay, it's not very big, but look at the large, several thousand. Okay, so here's an inverse relationship. We saw an inverse relationship with pH and hydrogen ion concentration in chapter two. Meaning, the more hydrogen ions you have in a solution, the lower the pH value, the, the more acidic it is. Okay? So as one goes up, the other value goes down. All right? In this case, we're going to see another inverse relationship between the size of the motor unit and the degree of control. Meaning, the smaller the motor unit, the greater the control. Like a one-on-one -on -one ratio. We see it in the eye all the time. We have to have precise movements and control of our eyes. Some of our smaller muscles in our hands, same thing. A surgeon, all right, they have to have fine control, especially when they're making incisions. So a lot of those smaller muscles in the hand have smaller motor units, okay? The larger the motor unit, the less precision you have. That's the inverse relationship. The larger the unit, all right, the less control or precision you have. All right. Questions about anything so far? Not too bad. Not too shabby. <clears throat> All right. This is showing you here. This next slide is basically just two graphs here that are showing you that top graph is showing you for recruitment here. All right. As we start to increase the voltage increments here, you'll see all right, our muscle tension increases. And, and you can see down below, I love this. All right, this is showing you as we start to increase our voltage and increase our muscle tension, how we're recruiting. The red ones are the muscle fibers that you're actually recruiting. This is a cross section of the muscle. So you can see here, we start to recruit a couple muscle fibers with a low amount of voltage. Now we increase the voltage. We're, in, we're increasing our tension, but we're recruiting more muscle fibers. Then eventually, you can see we've recruited all of them. All right? And we keep increasing the voltage, but it doesn't matter. We've plateaued. We can't recruit anything more. We've got them all. Okay? So that's what we're seeing, that pl plateau going on there. All right? All right. One of my favorite terms that I like to tell people all the time, you've got great muscle tone. Oh, my gosh. I love your muscle tone. All right? And basically, when you're laying down, all right, and if you've ever gone in for a massage, and if the massage therapist has said, oh, you're tight, they're referring to your muscle tone, all right? Or if you've ever been sitting somewhere and a friend comes up to you and you're sitting down and they put their hands on their shoulders, you know, I can't say that all of, all of us have a friend like this, but I had a friend like this when I was in high school. They were just a very handsy person, and they would just come up and always try to give people back rubs. Not like weird kind of stuff, all right? But just this is just how they were. It's very friendly. That's how they would engage. They talk, and this person would always remark on the, you're on your muscle tone. Oh my gosh, you're tight. Basically, what they were saying is your the tension in your muscle there, all right, is much higher than what it should be. All right, whatever is considered to be normal. But what could be normal for you might not be normal for me. All right, we all vary. But basically, what they're commenting on is is what happens is every once in a while your muscle units will discharge an action potential down to the muscle, all right? So it's just an involuntary action potential, the nervous stimulation that gets shot down to the muscle, all right? And this happens just at random periods, all right? And it will activate and cause contraction in some of those motor units, okay? And so it will generate, obviously, when you're activating motor units, you're going to 
cause muscle tension, right? And so, like I said, you could be generating more, all right, random action potentials or nervous stimulation than I could be. Therefore, your muscles might be tighter. All right? There's other causes for that, for your muscles to be tight, all right? But we refer to that tension when you're not doing anything as the resting muscle tone, all right? And it's a really cool concept because, all right, the muscles do not fatigue from this, all right? They're not causing any type of movement, but it's enough to where you can feel that there's a little bit of stiffness there. I shouldn't say it's stiffness, it's a bad choice. Tightness, I guess you could say, okay? So it kind of, it's like practice. It's kind of keeping the motor units on edge, you know, ready, in the ready position. Obviously, all right, when you're sleeping, okay, your motor muscle tone should be decreased because, and we'll talk more about this when we get into the nervous system, um, into the brain and spinal cord, uh, we talk about the reticular activating uh, uh, formation, or, uh, yeah, formation. Um, we'll talk about how things kind of just shut down when you're sleeping, okay? So this too should shut down, it should decrease, all right? So we've classified all the different types of muscle contractions, all right, and there's two types, isometric and isotonic, and then isotonic has two uh, uh, subtypes. So isometric is when we start to generate tension in the muscles, but yet there's no movement. All right, it's like pushing on a wall. If I were to walk over to that brick wall and push on it, all right, I'm not moving the wall, but I'm still going to be generating tension. Okay, so the amount of tension that I am actually generating is not enough to overcome the resistance of that wall. Okay, so during that period of time, the muscle stays the same length, does not change. Bodybuilders, perfect example, when they're out there flexing on stage and they're holding that pose. That's an isometric contraction, okay? If I go and shovel what my father calls heart attack snow, right, which is very wet, heavy snow, and I jam the shovel into the snow pile and I try to lift it up, if I can't move that shovel and I can't pick that snow up, that's an isometric muscle contraction, okay? All right, isotonic, again, we start to generate muscle tension, but this time it does overcome the resistance. Okay, so movement, movement will occur. Okay, so the length will change. So there's two types, concentric and eccentric. So concentric is when the muscle shortens in length, and eccentric is when the muscle lengthens. Okay, but both are generating tension. Both are contracting. All right, because remember, a contraction is when we're engaging in cross-bridge formation. And in some of those cases, the overall length of the muscle can contract, uh, uh, can, can lengthen, all right, and in some of those cases, that muscle can shorten. And I'll show you a picture here with a guy holding his baby. All right, so two types, isometric, tension is going to be generated and increased, not enough to overcome the resistance, all right? Muscle length does not change. There is no movement in isometric contraction. Isotonic, all right, muscle tension is generated, all right? It does overcome the resistance. Movement results, all right? But the length of the muscle can become shorter or it can become longer. If it becomes shorter, it's a concentric contraction. If it becomes longer, it's an eccentric contraction. Okay? So when you attempt to shovel a load of snow that is too heavy, what sort of muscle contraction are you using? Isometric, that's the one I was talking about with the heart attack snow. And here you can see in this picture here, this young man is holding this baby. Okay? He raises it up to his head. Okay? This is the biceps brachii. We all know this. So when he raises it up to his head and his face, all right, oh wait, this is, well, if he, when he raises it up to his head, I'll use this side. When he raises it up to his face like that, it's gonna be a concentric muscle contraction because the biceps brachii muscle shortens. When he lowers it back down to place the child in the crib, let's say, the biceps brachii muscle 
all right, will still be contracting as he slowly lowers the child to put it into the crib, that muscle will elongate or lengthen, okay? When he's holding the child here against his face, all right, the elbow is still flexed, all right, but there's no movement going on, okay? So the, the, there's tension occurring in the muscle, okay, no movement, all right, it's not overcoming the resistance of the weight of the child, okay? So when we talk about isometric contractions, one has to be very careful, especially around this time of year if you live in the northern conditions, because when you sustain an isometric contraction, it can actually affect your blood pressure and it can increase the blood pressure. Every year when I used to live up north, I'd hear this all the time, right? When we get a heavy snow, they'd always warn people on the news, especially if you have heart conditions or blood pressure issues, where they would say, if you're, you have to be careful shoveling snow for risk of increasing your blood pressure and having, in some cases, a heart attack, but a stroke, an aneurysm. You have to be careful, okay? Because not only that, when you're outside and it's cold outside, well, what happens, all right? The hypothalamus senses that, that there's a decrease in temperature and it's gonna cause vaso, uh, uh, constriction of the blood vessels in your skin, and it's gonna shunt all the blood to your, to your uh, systemic circulation. That's gonna increase your blood pressure. And then adding to that, isometric contractions will also increase that blood pressure even more when you're putting yourself at risk, right? For damage, that's one of the biggest things. I mean, we don't really talk about it too much. I mean, none of us are really concerned that our five-year-old is gonna have an aneurysm. Okay? Because they have relatively, they should have a relatively healthy vascular system. Okay, it's the older folks, right? People like in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, onward and upward, who's uh, uh, been around for a little while, all right. And over time, you may have damaged parts of the vascular system, and it's those parts that were damaged, all right, if they haven't healed correctly, where you can have a compromise and have an issue um, with uh, an aneurysm. All right. Length tension relationship. The length tension relationship refers to how much tension that is produced is going to affect the length of the muscle. Okay? So, how much tension is produced will affect the length of the muscle. So, this is important to understand. I'm going to come right back. To this slide here. Hold tight. So the length tension curve, this picture here is showing us, all right, we've got three different configurations here, all right, maximally contracted, resting length, and then stretched, okay. Here you have maximum overlap. I won't call it maximal overlap, but you have where there's quite a bit of overlap going on here. Here we have no overlap, and here it's like Goldilocks. This is just right. This is Goldilocks. This is resting length. All right, so you can see on our graph here, okay, depending on the length of the sarcomere, you can see how much muscle tension, all right, can be generated. Now, obviously, when we get up to 100%, the best, uh, all right, the best position to be in for maximal muscle tension is resting length. If you're contracted, all right, you can't go anywhere, so we can't get up to 100%, and we're stretched, there's no overlap. All right, we're going to talk about that here, okay? So those three different ones. we got resting length, shorten when we just have maximal uh, uh, overlapping, and then stretched really far, okay? So the resting length, all right, is where we're going to see that maximum contractile force. And we refer to this as the optimal overlap. All right, this is what we want, okay? And this concept, we'll revisit this when you get into the cardiac system when we're talking about the functionality of the heart, okay? Because that's what we're looking for, all right? We want to look for optimal overlap between the thick and thin filaments because if we get optimal overlap, we can get a much, a much forceful, much more forceful contraction, all right? Especially if we're dealing with the heart, we can pump more blood out of the heart, especially if you're working out or exercising, okay? If we're dealing with the fiber at the shortened length, that's this guy here, all right, here, when they're already contracted, 
all right, we're going to see that the movement of the thick and thin filaments is going to be very limited, all right, because look at that. They're jammed up against each other here. Where else can they go, all right? That's at the, ma the maximum uh, uh, approximation for the Z disks. So they got nowhere to go. And then finally, at the extended, when they're stretched out, right, we are also going to see a weaker force because there's very little overlap. Okay? Very little. In order to, in order to have a cross bridge formation, you need to have something to grab onto. Okay? And if there's no overlap or very minimal, you're not going to get much. Okay, so think of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Not too much, not too little, just right. All right, and the just right is in our resting position, right here. Resting length, ah, uh, just right. Okay, optimal overlap, minute, hardly any. All right, way too much. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? All right, in which muscle length can a muscle generate the most tension? Contracted resting length or stretched, and why? Resting length, optimal overlap. Okay. Okay. So we talked about our energy uh, processes and how to generate energy, an oxygen jet. That's how to um, kind of make our way back from uh, uh, those energy uh, utilization methods. But now we're going to talk about getting tired, as most of us do at the end of the day or when we're getting done with a certain amount of, of activity here, okay? And so obviously when you get tired, you're going to significantly impair, all right, your ability to produce muscle tension, all right? So the number one, the primary cause is going to be, hey, where'd that glycogen go? All right, we don't have stored glucose inside the cell. And that sucks. Okay, so that's going to be the problem. Because what does glucose? What does glycogen do? All right, it's glucose. And what's glucose going to be? ATP. Okay, so that's the primary cause. Okay, decrease in our glycogen. Okay, a couple other things. What happens when we don't have enough calcium at the neuromuscular junction? Well, if we're not going to have a lot of calcium. It's going to significantly impair the number of synaptic vesicles that have our neurotransmitter. The more calcium that we can flood into the synaptic knob, I remember, because we need a lot of calcium to coat those synaptic vesicles, because then that turns that synaptic vesicle to a positively charged thing. And that positively charged thing gets attracted to the negatively charged inside of the plasma membrane near the synaptic cleft so we can undergo exocytosis. So if you go from, let's say, I don't know, 10,000 molecules of calcium to five molecules of calcium, that's a problem. We're not gonna be able to get enough in there, okay? All right, look at this term, excitation contraction coupling, okay? That's what happens in between everything at the neuromuscular junction and the cross bridge cycling, okay? So let's just say you're, um, uh, give me a second here. I'm trying to think about it. You're on a special diet. I'll make it easier. You're not doing any salt whatsoever. And the only thing that you are eating is going to be oranges. That's it. Water and oranges. Well, guess what? You're going to impair your electrolytes. So you're not going to really have any sodium and potassium, all right, amongst other things. Okay. So we've changed our ion concentrations now. Now remember, we need to maintain the proper levels so, uh, of ions so we can have that gradient, that electrochemical gradient. So if our sodium and potassium are all out of whack, then it's going to really cause us a problem in generating an action potential. And so that's going to be an issue. Going back to... In, if you're hypocalcemic, right, when you have low blood calcium stores, not stores, but concentrations, all right, we can see how that affects excitation at the neuromuscular junction, but here it is again. If you have low calcium, all right, then that's going to impair how much calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, 
because you don't have a lot of it, into the sarcoplasm. Remember, the more calcium that you release, the better off you are, the more cross bridges that you can get. This is an important concept that you're going to visit again in cardiac physiology. So you need to know that. More calcium, more cross bridges, more muscle tension, more contraction, more tension. That's what we're looking for. All right, cross bridge cycling, the final phase all right, of our, mu our skeletal muscle contraction picture here. Look at this, excessive inorganic phosphate. Okay, if you have a lot of inorganic phosphate that's just floating around inside the cytoplasm, all right, because, for example, the cell is not recycling that inorganic phosphate to make more ATP, so it's just going to hang out there. Now, it's going to inhibit or slow down the release of that inorganic phosphate from the myosin head. All right, if that's not popping off there during that power stroke, that's a problem. Because how can we get ATP to attach onto it if the inorganic phosphate is in the way? And if you have tons of inorganic phosphate going around, then that means you're not having a lot of ATP, okay? Or the cell's not recycling it enough, okay? So that's another problem in and itself. And here it goes. Here's that calcium again, all right? Decreased calcium. We cannot move the troponin tropomyosin complex off of, all right, the myosin binding site and the actin. We don't like that. That's no good. No bueno. Okay, so let's talk about exercise. I'm sure we're all familiar with the t different types of exercise, all right? Endurance exercise, okay, and resistance exercise, okay? Endurance exercise helps us with this, which is awesome, ATP production, okay? So when we have endurance exercise, eventually what we're going to see is, and this is some of the cellular changes that will occur, all right, in the cells over time, is that we'll start to produce more mitochondria. The more mitochondria you have in a cell, the more ATP you can produce. So over time, through sustained exercise programs, if you're doing endurance exercise, you can increase your ATP production through more mitochondria formation. Resistance exercise, lifting weights, okay, is going to lead to this phenomenon here, hypertrophy. Okay? Hypertrophy, we saw this back in Chapter 5 when we were talking about tissues, is an increase in the tissue size. Okay? And so we're dealing with muscles. We're going to see an increase in the size because we're going to make more actin and myosin. Because we're not growing more cells. That's hyperplasia. All right, but what we will do is we'll make more contractile proteins. All right, that's cool. So we can get more cross bridges. I like that. because Remember what I said, more cross bridges, more muscle tension, more force. All right, so now we have to actually fuel those muscle contractions. All right, cool. Let's put more glycogen in there and more mitochondria. All right, I like that. This is good. This is good. Now, I did say that skeletal muscle undergoes hypertrophy. Okay? And normally, it doesn't undergo hyperplasia. But in some situations, remember, there's always exceptions to the rules. All right? When we're dealing with hyperplasia, we can get an increase in the number of fibers, the number of muscle cells. All right? But that is limited, limited. Okay? All right, so the opposite of hypertrophy is atrophy. Okay? You break your leg, it goes in a cast. Two months later, it comes off. Your leg is significantly smaller than the other leg. Right? We call that disuse atrophy. Okay? And so what we'll see in some of these folks, because of that lack of exercise, no problem. After a while, you just start using it more. All right? A lot of that tissue will come back. But all right, if you do not, all right, if you do not try to exercise that muscle, a lot of that muscle tissue will convert into CT stands for connective tissue. And as we know, connective tissue doesn't have elasticity in contractile components. Connective tissue, therefore, will never be as good as the muscle tissue that it replaced. All right, and because you have fewer muscle fibers, all right, your muscle tone will decrease and so will your power. That sucks. All right.
questions about that? All right, all right. Real quick, real quick here. One more time. Encore presentation. No. Nobody want to see that. Here we are. All right. You use muscles every day to do activities. This woman is using muscles to breathe, circulate blood, and move her hand to take notes. Your cardiac and smooth muscle tissues are involuntary. You do not consciously control their actions. Skeletal muscle works under voluntary control. Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Muscle fibers are composed of many myofibrils. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments, giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere, called the M-line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin, which are anchored to the Z-lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z-lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend. All right, so this is gonna be that cocking, okay? All right. I know it's not starting at the same uh, uh, four-step process. This is starting at, at, at that step three here, where we start to see all right, that ATP gets hydrolyzed, all right, causes it to extend and go into that cocking position there. All right, now you're going to see. And, and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M line thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of... See that now? See, that's step two, all right? Uh, no, wait, is that step two? Yeah, yeah, all right. So it didn't get released until the ATP bound onto it. ATP binds freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding and more contraction or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. 
Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. The electrical impulse travels down the T-tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils where they trigger a muscle contraction. As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the Z lines draw closer to the M line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. When muscle fibers contract in unison... All right. So I bet you this video is not as intimidating now to you. Well, once after you've seen it a couple of times and after making it through. All right. So you should feel a little bit better about some of the understanding there of that material. Um, all right, let's finish up here and talk about what happens to the skeletal muscle as you age. All right, again, and you know from interacting with people, pretty much you have probably a pretty decent idea as to what happens to muscle as we age. Okay, we start to lose it. Okay. And so this occurs usually in the third decade of your life. And on average, it's said to be that every decade after the, your 30s, you'll lose roughly about 10% of your muscle mass. All right. Now, of course, it varies from person to person. Activity level, you know the same. If you don't use it, you lose it. But if you're a person that's relatively active, all right, then that will not apply to you. Okay. But you can see, all right, overall, our over we start to have a decrease in activity. And so then our muscle mass will start to decrease because we saw what happens with hypertrophy. All right. When you start to gain more actin and, my, uh, and, and, and actin and myosin contractile proteins. All right. If you don't use it, well, then you'll start to lose those proteins. Therefore, you'll see the size of the muscle decrease. If you have fewer actin and myosin contractile proteins, your ability to generate muscle tension decreases, all right, and to sustain those contractions decrease, okay? So big issue is the decrease in the, or, the, the, uh, the O2, all right, storage for these muscles because of myoglobin that decreases and circulation starts to drop off, okay? Because when tissues need, all right, oxygen, you'll have a decent vascular supply. But if you don't use those tissues, then the vascular supply to those tissues uh, will decrease. Okay. Now, unfortunately, in situations where you do injure yourself, all right, what helps us to recover from injury is the role of the satellite cells. All right. But those too have a tendency to decrease. Well, if the satellite cells um, can be present. Well, guess what takes over? Fibroblasts. Okay. Going back here on this slide here, you saw this concept, muscle tissue will transition into connective tissue during atrophy. Well, guess what? When you don't have satellites that can help repair the muscle tissue, well, okay, we have another set of cells. Those fibroblasts come in and they'll start to lay down collagen fibers and it'll form that dense regular connective tissue. That dense regular connective tissue is that scar tissue, right? And as we know, scar tissue does not have flexibility. So their overall tissue will become less flexible. When you become less flexible, now you're stuck into this uh, uh, cycle. You become less flexible. You're more prone to injury. You injure yourself. Then that injury then gets replaced with more scar tissue. So you just kind of get into this perpetuating cycle. All right? I'm not saying that getting old sucks, but this is some of the stuff that you get to look forward to. Okay? All right, so what is the term for an increase in the fiber size? That's going to be hypertrophy. All right. And what are some of the changes in skeletal muscle accompany aging? All right. So we saw all this is just the whole list of all that decreased muscle mass, all right, decrease in the fiber number and diameter, blah, blah, blah. All right. All right, a couple minutes. I just want to jump into the cardiac uh, muscle tissue. You'll go into this in a little bit. You, all, you thought that this was all skeletal muscle, this whole chapter. Yeah. Remember, it's muscle. It's 
So we have two other muscle types to talk about. Skeletal, I mean uh, cardiac and smooth. All right. So cardiac muscles, we had a, a brief introduction to cardiac muscle cells. All right. As we know, skeletal muscle cells are long and cylindrical. They do not branch. Well, cardiac muscle cells do. Remember, this is the one I told you. It's like a shape of a Y line on its side. Okay. It can have one to two nuclei. It too is striated because it also has sarcomeres. So since it has sarcomeres, it ha that means it has actin and myosin and it undergoes the cross bridging formation. All right, that's cool. But cardiac muscle cells have loads and loads of mitochondria. And that makes absolute sense. Because think about it. All right, does your heart shut off when you're sleeping? No, it's beating all the time. All right, beating all the time and it undergoes aerobic respiration. This thing is going all of the time. So we need lots of mitochondria to make lots of ATP. So your heart needs lots of oxygen, okay? So here are these intercalated discs. We saw those, those were those, were those darkened lines that we saw scattered throughout some of the cardiac muscle cells, all right? And so what they are made up of are desmosomes and gap junctions. The desmosome is basically all right, an anchoring site. Okay. It allows these cardiac muscle cells to attach to each other very tightly, very cohesively. All right, So it acts as an anchor, so it helps with the contractile force that is generated during a muscle contraction. Gap junctions are a group of proteins, there's about six of them, and they make these pores, these small little openings, these holes in between the muscle fibers. Okay, So here's the hole. All right, and that allows ions to flow. I know that's good too. That allows ions to flow from one cell to the next, kind of like what we saw with saltatory conduction. All right, when we were dealing with the neural fibril nodes. All right, so as ions can roll through the cells, it helps to propagate. All right, action potentials through the cells much easier, much quicker. So the electrical current can flow through these cells. All right which is great when we're specifically dealing with our pacemakers, all right, to help stimulate contraction of the cardiac muscle cells. All right, cardiac muscle cells are not operated by the somatic nervous system. They're not under voluntary control. They are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. You have no control over that. So the rate, the speed at which your heart contracts and the force of that contraction is governed by the autonomic nervous system. All right, so here's a cool picture of our cardiac muscle cell. All right, you can see how it's branching. All right, it's got a couple nuclei. All right, it's striated, so it's got uh, the sarcomeres there. And then we have our desmosomes and our gap junctions. All right, and those are found inside the intercalated discs. And then we have numerous tons and tons and tons of mitochondria all over the place. Okay, to help generate that ATP. So what is the difference between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle? Okay, here you can see it. All right, skeletal muscle has way more nuclei. Cardiac muscle can have one to two. Skeletal muscle does not branch. Cardiac does. Okay, skeletal muscle can be much longer. All right, it does not have intercalated discs. It is controlled by the somatic nervous system. Somatic for skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle is going to be stimulated by our pacemaker cells. Okay, we get to learn about that in cardiac physiology. All right, but the rate and the force of contraction is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Okay. All right, smooth muscle. Mm. All right, I'm going to stop here because it's going to take me a little bit longer to get to the rest of that. All right, and then we'll just pick it up on Tuesday and Thursday. There's only like five more slides left. And then we'll do the brain. Okay, so we're almost done with your lecture material. All right, if you folks have any questions, save them for me because I'm going to stop recording. This whole thing is going to crash. I can feel it.